كل شيخ تفضل ان شاء الله تعالى الله يبارك فيك بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على خاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه والتابعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد Indeed all praises belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for he is the creator, sustainer and controller of the universe and all within and we invoke his peace and blessings upon his noble messenger, his family, his companions and all those who follow them in righteousness until the end of time and we pray that Allah the Exalted will bless us all to be among them respected sisters and brothers in Islam Assalamu Alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh <clears throat> I trust that everyone is doing well and enjoying the nice weather and staying out of the storm um, so far it hasn't been too bad in uh, at least in the Scarborough area and we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his blessings and for his grace upon us. All right. Um, so today, inshallah, brothers and sisters, we are going to look at an issue that, as I've mentioned in the past, you know, when we study history, we, we tend to think of it as a series of events that happened in the past and it's no longer relevant to us, but just for the acquisition of theoretical knowledge, we, we study history. Of course, that is not completely true for many things that have happened in history, as we call it, still may impact our lives directly or even indirectly. Uh, our topic today in the life of the third uh, rightly guided Khalifa, Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu, is one of his greatest achievements as Khalifa. And it is an event and an, and an issue that affects us directly today. And not just uh, affects us directly, but it's a very important issue because it is about the collection of the Qur'an. And the Qur'an, of course, brothers and sisters, the Qur'an forms the foundations of Islam. Um, uh, and you know, at the end of the day, if your foundation is solid and strong, then your building is strong. But if your foundation is weak and shaky, then your building will crumble sooner or later. And this is why even before people um, start to worry about why does Islam allow this and why does Islam allow that or why does Islam prohibit this? In fact, before anyone begins to question the whys of any religion, they should probably look at whether that religion has a solid foundation or not. Because if it does not have a solid foundation, then really the building itself is shaky. And yes, you're going to have many questions. But when the foundation is solid, then the building is solid. And if the foundation is foolproof, as we say, then the person should realize, you know what? Perhaps this is the truth. So in my humble view, it all comes down to the, the basis of every religion. And if you look at the basis or the foundation of every religion, obviously for a divinely inspired religion, the foundation is usually scripture, revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, so if you look at the foundation and you find that there are issues and questions with the foundation about its validity and correctness and all that, then you know that this cannot be the truth from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because Allah the creator is of infinite knowledge and wisdom. So his knowledge cannot be wrong. He cannot make mistakes. He cannot be mistaken. He cannot not know something. All right. So subhanallah, you would expect that revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be perfectly correct and absolutely correct in all aspects. And this is exactly why, brothers and sisters, Allah the Exalted in the Quran, in Surah An-Nisa, has challenged the whole of mankind. He has challenged them about this issue. Allah says, أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنِ do they not study and ponder this Qur'an? 
ولو كان من عند غير الله لوجدوا فيه اختلافا كثيرا if it had been from any source other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they would find in it many contradictions many uh, incorrect information but subhanallah up to today the best minds in the world have not been able to come up with even one instance let alone two or three or four or ten or twenty just one one instance where the quran is mistaken you know whether its scientific information is incorrect and subhanallah the, the quran has spoken about various um uh, disciplines of natural science geography um, biology physics um so none of this information up to today has ever been proven to be incorrect in fact in most cases the information has been proven to be very very precise So, uh, subhanallah, the information of the Qur'an, no one has ever been able to find any discrepancy, any mistake, any contradiction. Even in its, its grammatical style, there are no grammatical mistakes in the Qur'an. When a human being writes, um, you know, unless they review and review and review and review, we here and there may make a mistake you know even if it's a dot that that is below the letter when it should have been above the letter subhanallah but even grammatically speaking there are no mistakes in the quran subhanallah so even if you look at it from a linguistic perspe perspective it is perfect so allah has made it clear look the the way the test to prove that any so-called revelation is not revelation from Allah is that you would find contradictions and discrepancies in it if you can find contradictions in it then it is not from Allah that's the yardstick this is how you can disprove the Quran but try as people may they have not been able to discover any mistakes in the Quran or contradictions subhanallah and I think this is where everybody needs to start right because we may or may not understand the wisdom behind certain things so we ask questions but we may not understand the wisdom behind it but that doesn't really matter because if your foundation is solid then you know you're you're in the right building you know your building won't collapse collapse on you and then you know it will take some time for you to dig in and, and, and search for answers so i believe that the journey begins the journey for the truth starts with examining the foundation of the religion which in this case is the quran and so one of the major in fact uh, perhaps the major accomplishment of the khalifa uthman ibn affan may allah always be pleased with him um, is the collection of the quran now um as we all know and like i said you know this the quran impacts our lives directly today in a month ago, we were all in, in the month of Ramadan, we were uh, reciting Quran. We were, we were listening to the Imam in Taraweeh. SubhanAllah. Same Quran. Now, the entire Quran, as it was revealed to the Prophet, alayhi salatu um, it was put into written form. It is a misconception that most non Muslims have, and many Muslims also that the Qur'an was only put into written form after the death of the Prophet ﷺ. That is not true. It is true that during the lifetime of the Prophet ﷺ, the Qur'an was put into writing. It just was not collected and gathered in one place as a book. Now, uh, you know this is a different course obviously this is another course a discussion for another course uh, on ulum al-quran um, but there are a hadith in sahih al-bukhari and sahih muslim subhanallah authentic a hadith 
in which we are told that the Prophet وسلم, had scribes. And when Quran was revealed to him, he would call one of them and say to them, put these verses, write these verses with those verses in such and such a surah. So the Prophet is alive and he's dictating to the companions, the scribes, where to put these verses, after which verses and in which surah. So the claim that it was not written except after the death of the Prophet ﷺ is not true. It's false. However, it just was not collected and put together in one place, in one book. All of it was written down, but it was on loose pieces of paper. Some companions had a few surahs or ayats and others have an, had another few and so on. And theoretically speaking, if you were to gather all these written materials and put them together, you will have the whole Quran. Now, also, in the Prophet's time, the surahs of the Qur'an were not in order. Because remember, revelation was coming to him uh, uh, up until a few days before he passed away, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So, he did not have the time, subhanallah. All right, one may ask, well, how come the Prophet himself didn't do this, right? Compile the Qur'an and put it in order so that there are no questions afterwards. Well, look at the reality, brothers and sisters. Revelation came to him up until about three days before he died. And for the last two weeks of his life, he was very ill. Well, he was ill and then uh, his illness progressively got worse and worse. So not only did he not, did he not, did he not have the time, but he was also ill. Who can do much when they're ill? SubhanAllah. So he had no time to really organize and put it together. It was all written down, but the order of the surahs were not put in, in order because it wasn't gathered in one place as a book, right? Now, the companions, of course, they, um, they knew the order of the surahs, of course. How? Well, the most famous way is through salah. They prayed with the Prophet, and they heard him recite in a certain order. And sometimes the Prophet ﷺ even used to recite Quran in the, on the member in the khutbah. There is a hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari where a lady said she learned a particular surah of the Quran simply by hearing the Prophet ﷺ recite it on the member and he used to recite it so often on the member during the khutbah on Friday. Yes, his khutbah would be a surah he recites. And of course the people understood Arabic so there wasn't much explanation that need that, that was needed. So this is how the companions knew the order of the surah. Now, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq is the first person, of course, to commission the collection of these loose pages that the Quran was written on and put them together and bring them together in one place. This is what Abu Bakr did. Now, of course, in the time of Abu Bakr Siddiq, and I know we spoke about this uh, uh, perhaps since last year, all right, when we looked at the life of Abu Bakr Siddiq, um, when he commissioned the collection of the Quran and ordered Zaid ibn Thabit to do it, Zaid did not just collect like that, right? Okay, guys, bring me the loose pages, let's put it together, and we have the Quran. No. Zaid and other companions, such as Umar ibn al Khattab, they were sitting in the masjid and the Sahaba who had written uh, pieces of the Quran on, in, on, 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 written on whatever uh, sort of written material, they would bring these. And Zaid ibn Thabit is Hafid and Umar ibn al-Khattab is Hafid. And they would get other companions to recite from memory while they are checking the written material, making sure they did not miss anything. You all know if you go back to the life of uh, Abu Bakr Siddiq, Zaid ibn Thabit said he found one ayah from Surah at tawbah He did not find it in written form except with one single companion, subhanAllah. Everybody else had memorized, but only one person had it in written form. Now, so when Abu Bakr commissioned his collection of the Quran, there was a process of verification that was followed to ensure that nothing was missed of the Qur'an. 
And plus, what uh, Abu Bakr did, or what Zaid ibn Thabit did for Abu Bakr Siddiq, was to also organize the surahs in the order that the Prophet ﷺ taught the companions. Now, Uthman ibn Affan, when he had a challenge and a, a, a situation to, to look after and to rectify, what he basically did was he took the copy that Abu Bakr had made. It was with Abu Bakr Siddiq while he was alive. Then Umar ibn al-Khattab, when he became the Khalifa, it was in his possession. And then when Umar radiallahu anhu passed away and was martyred, his, his daughter Hafsa, the wife of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, she got possession of this uh, uh, suhuf or mushaf. And it was in her care until Uthman when uh, the situation came to his attention and he needed to, to um, collect this Quran and revise it per, perhaps again, he, uh, he used the, the, the copy that Abu Bakr had, that Hafsa now had, and from that copy, basically, they made several copies. And he would send this to the various Muslim provinces. This is what Uthman did. And by the way, brothers and sisters, this uh, collection of the Quran that was ordered by the Khalifa Uthman ibn Affan, this has become the standard version of all the masahif in the world today. And this is why it is called the Uthmani Mus'haf. Uthmani in relation to the Khalifa Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu. Now, all right. And of course, there are a lot of details that we have to go through. Don't worry. Now, um, one other thing before we continue is when Uthman ordered the collection, right? They didn't just take Abu Bakr's copy and, and make copies of it. No. At the same time, he also ordered a number of companions, we will go into the details inshallah, to also double check and make sure that nothing was missed of the Quran. Right? So there was another rigorous verification process that, that happened at this time, not just in Abu Bakr's time, but in this time to make sure that nothing was missing of the Quran. And inshallah, we'll talk about detail, details when we get to that. Now, the question, of course, is why did Uthman do this? What pressing need did he have to order a second collection of the Quran? Well, here we go. The people of Iraq and Sham, right? Iraq, you know where that is today. You know where Sham is, Syria and that part of the Middle East. The Muslims from these two um, provinces, if you like, they happen to be in the Muslim army when they went to battle in Armenia and Azerbaijan. All right, so Armenia and Azerbaijan are uh, sort of north of Turkey there. So remember, they're all Muslims. They're all in the same army. And of course, the people of Sham and Iraq, they differed in their recitation of Quran. The people of Sham, of course, recited how they learned and the people of Iraq, they recited how they learned from the companions who settled there, of course, right? So uh, it's not like they're de developed, they had developed their own way of reciting. So Hudayfa ibn al Yaman, radiallahu anhu, came from uh, these battles up in the north of Turkey, and he came to Medina and he said to the Khalifa Uthman, Ya Amirul Mu'mineen, save this nation before they differ about the book, meaning the Quran, as the Jews and Christians have differed before. This was his statement to Uthman. Now, what is this difference? Uthman asked him, you know, what is this difference? What's what's going on? And he said, uh, Uthayfa said to Uthman, the Khalifa, look, the people of Sham are reciting the Quran based on the recitation of Ubay ibn Kaab. Ubay ibn Kaab settled in Sham and the people learned from him. And the people of Iraq, they have learned the, the, the way of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud of reciting the Quran. And there is a little difference, right? We'll talk about the different qira'at and so on, just inshallah when we get to that, right? So, 
each set of people, mashallah, have learned Quran, authentic Quran, from the companions who settled in, in, in each place. Now, of course, because of the difference in, in Qiraat and all that, and recitation, you have one group of people reciting in a recitation that the other had ne had ne has ne have never heard before. All right, subhanAllah, I know these days many of us have become a little bit uh, aware of the Qira'ah of Qalun because we have the IIT, we have our Qurra who recite in the in the version of Qalun. But I am sure for the first time you heard them reciting the Quran in Qalun, in Surah Al-Fatiha, they say Maliki Yawmiddin in Hafs. And you know what? The vast majority of Muslims in the world today recite by the, the recitation of Hafs. We say Maliki Yawmiddin with an alif on the ma, a stretch on the ma. But in Qalun, it's short, Maliki Yawmiddin. I'm sure when you heard it for the first time, you were thinking, hey, did this guy just make, make a mistake here, right? So each side is accusing the others of disbelief. Oh, you guys are changing the Quran. You're tampering with the Quran. How can you recite like this? It wasn't revealed like that because we don't know that, right? This is what Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman meant. Before they differ, as the Jews and the Christians differ about the book, about the Quran. This is when Uthman ibn Affan, radiyallahu anhu, he sent a messenger to Hafsa radiallahu anha and requested her to send the manuscripts, the suhuf of the Quran that Abu Bakr had made. Now it is the, 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 the uh, manuscripts that Abu Bakr had done, the collection of the Quran that he had done is called suhuf because the word suhuf means loose pages. They're put together, but they're still loose. All right, what Uthman would do, radiallahu anhu, they would actually bound it now. So it's one book. You cannot remove the pages. To remove, you have to rip it apart. You know, you have these binders, uh, and you use it. Uh, the kids in school use it for school work, and you can add and take out pages. Ah, it's something like that in Abu Bakr's time. Loose pages put together. So it's called suho. So... He requested these from Hafsa radiallahu anha. And he told her, look, we will make copies from them into masahif. Masahif is a slightly is slightly different from suhuf, right? The plural, uh, the masahif is plural. By the way, the singular is mushaf. Mushaf means those suhuf, loose pages put together, but now you bind them together. When they're binded together, bounded together, and you cannot remove the pages anymore, it's called mushaf. So he told her, we will make copies into the masahif, right? In other words, not only will we make copies, but we will bind them so that the pages are no longer loose and we will return the original to you. And then Uthman ibn Affan, he ordered four companions to make copies from Abu Bakr's copy in addition to verifying the text at the same time abu bakr commissioned just one companion zaid ibn thabit and zaid ibn thabit by the way brothers and sisters is one of the number of scribes who used to write revelation for the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and this is why abu bakr selected him uthman ordered four companions not just one to to, to make copies and at the same time Verify the text again. Make sure nothing is, is missing or out of place. Now, here are the four companions he, he commissioned to do the work. We have number one, Zaid ibn Thabit. He is from the Ansar, and he is the one who did the collection for Abu Bakr Siddiq, and he was he is also a scribe for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So since he was involved in the first collection, it only made sense to involve him again or to have him play a lead role in the collection the second time. The second companion is Abdullah ibn Zubair. Right? This is Zubair ibn al-Awwam. As Zubair ibn al-Awwam is one of the ten companions who were given good news by the Prophet of paradise. Right? They are famously known as al-Asharatu 
al mubasharin bil jannah abdullah is his son and by the way abdullah ibn zubair brothers and sisters is the first child the first muslim child among the immigrants the muhajirin to be born in medina after the hijrah his mother is asma the sister of aisha radiallahu anha the daughter of abu bakr siddiq but aisha and, ha and asma they have different mothers the same father in abu bakr siddiq so abdullah ibn zubair mashallah was born the first child to be born among the immigrants the muhajirin of course after the hijrah in medina within weeks of his of his mom migrating she he, he, she gave birth which means she migrated while she was pregnant subhanallah and you know what his mother brought him to the prophet alayhi salam and the prophet alayhi salam held him in his hands and he took a date or a piece of a date and he chewed it till it became soft and you know mixed with his saliva and then he took his finger and he put pieces of it in the baby's mouth this is called tahnik and, and Abdullah ibn Zubair used to be proud of this and he used to say to the companions you know the first thing that ever went into my stomach was the saliva of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he was proud of that and it was the Prophet alayhi salam who also named him Abdullah yes so Abdullah ibn Zubair mashallah a very very well-known companion a man of high status he is from Quraysh. Zaid ibn Thabit is from the Ansar. Number three, Sa'id ibn al-As, he is from Quraysh. And number four, Abdurrahman ibn al-Harith ibn Hisham, he is also from Quraysh. So the four people charged with the collection and verification of the Quran, you have three of them from Quraysh and one from the Ansar. Now, Uthman ibn Affan, radiallahu anhu, after he appointed these four individuals, he said to the three scribes or the three companions who are from Quraysh, he said, in case you disagree with Zaid ibn Thabit, on any point in the Quran, you know, how to say this word or whatever, then write it in the dialect of Quraysh, as the Quran was revealed in their tongue. So this was his order. If you differ with Zaid ibn Thabit about a word, how to say it, well, how to say it, all right? Does it should it have Dhammar? Should it have Kasra? Should it have Fatha? If you differ, then write it in the dialect of Quraysh. Because it was revealed in their tongue, right? The bulk of the Quran, the vast majority of the Quran is in the language or the dialect of Quraysh. In any case. The Quraysh were the first people to be addressed by the Quran directly. In another version of this hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari, also, uh, Uthman ibn Affan said to the four men, in case you disagree with Zaid ibn Thabit regarding any dialectic Arabic utterance of the Quran, يعني في عربية من عربية القرآن. You know how to say the word. Is it Nanshuruha or Nunshizuha, right? He said, you write it in the dialect of Quraysh. Write it how Quraysh would say it. For the Quran was revealed in their dialect. Now remember, brothers and sisters, Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman saw the problem with the Muslims from Iraq and from Sham arguing over the recitation of Quran. Yes, each group was reciting according to how it was revealed, but they, they, they didn't realize that perhaps because they learned one way of reciting from the companions who settled in their area. Now, Uthman had to address this problem. How does he produce something that is standard that will be standard for the whole Muslim world? So people are not arguing and fighting as to whose recitation is right and whose is wrong or whose is better and things like that. So he told them, listen, you differ. If you differ, if you don't differ, alhamdulillah. In case you differ, then do, write it in the dialect of Quraysh. Now let me point out here, brothers and sisters, and I will repeat it later on. There is absolutely no proof that these three men differed with Zayd ibn Thabit about any Arabic utterance in the Quran. 
So although the order was given, there was no proof that it was actually practically implemented because they never differed with Zaid ibn Thabit. Okay? Bear that in mind. Now, the four did as they were instructed. They were instructed to use Uthman's, uh, Abu Bakr's copy and collection of the Quran and to make copies from this. But while they're doing this, they are to also verify the text and make sure that no verse or no word was missing. So they made some copies. I shouldn't say many because, you know, many, you would think maybe 20, 30, 40, right? No, they didn't make that many copies. They actually made about seven, five to seven copies. And then uh, Uthman returned the original manuscripts that Abu Bakr had done back to Hafsa. And then he sent a copy of what he had commissioned to, to every major Muslim province. Right, So he sent one copy from the copies that were made to the major provinces. So not every city got a copy, no. In addition to that, he also ordered that all other Quranic materials and fragmentary manuscripts or even whole copies that companions had as their personal mushaf, he ordered them to burn all these things. Now, if you want a mushaf, come and take our copy and you make your own copy. Now, I know what you're thinking, right? Why would he do this? If a companion already has his own personal mushaf, why burn that and make him rewrite the whole thing, right? Okay, we'll talk about that. Don't worry. So this is what he did, radiallahu anhu. He ordered that all these fragmentary pieces of the Qur'an, you know, some people might have a few surah, some half the Qur'an, maybe some the whole Qur'an, whatever. He says, destroy it, burn it. Now, who is this Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman? Let me just share with you a little bit of information about Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman, radiallahu anhu. He is well known as the keeper of the secret of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He is well known as the keeper of the secret of the Prophet Alaihi Wasallam. al qama one of the great Tabi'een scholars, once he went to Sham, Syria, right? And he went to the masjid, and when he went into the masjid, he said, he made a, he made a short dua. He said, oh Allah, bless me to sit with a righteous companion. I want to sit with a with a, a righteous companion, right? Because you sit with a companion, you learn from him. And he said, Subhanallah, I was blessed to sit with Abu Darda. Radiallahu anhu. And Abu Darda said to him, From where are you? And Al Qama said, From the people of Kufa. I'm from the people of Kufa. And Abu Darda said to him, to al that is, isn't there amongst you the keeper of the secret which nobody else knows? And al said he meant Hudayfa. Isn't there among you the keeper of the secret of the Prophet ﷺ which nobody else knows? And he said, yes. Right. So in this hadith from Sahih al-Bukhari, as you can see, we know that Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman, he is the keeper of the secret of the Prophet ﷺ. In another version of the hadith, in Sahih al-Bukhari as well, Abu Darda said, isn't there among you, amongst you the keeper of the secret of the Prophet ﷺ, which no one knows except him? Now, you see, brothers and sisters, you might be wondering, why did I mention both hadith? Here is why. You see, each version has information that the other does not have. And together, you get the full picture. With one alone, you get part of the picture. For example, if you take the first version here, isn't there amongst you the keeper of the secret which nobody else knows? And al qama said he meant Hudayfa. Now in this, in this uh, hadith, we know that it is Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman who was the keeper of the secret. But, but secret of whom? I said the secret of the Prophet ﷺ. But this hadith or this version doesn't say the secret of the Prophet ﷺ. It simply says the keeper of the secret. 
Now to prove that it was a secret of the Prophet salam, we need to go to the other version. Yes, right? Because in this version, Abu Darda said, isn't there amongst you the keeper of the secret of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which no one knows except him? And of course, Al-Qama said yes. The thing is, in this second version, Al-Qama did not say he meant Hudayfa. Because if he did that, then we could use this one version and it would cover both issues, right? Um, and this, by the way, brothers and sisters, actually, Al-Imam Al-Bukhari in his Sahih, he does this a lot. Not a lot of people realize that you know they look at the text and they see the text is pretty much the same. Sometimes it's not just the text that is that he that he wants a particular statement to 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 to, to clarify. Sometimes it's about the isnad. Yes. Sometimes it's about the isnad. So he may narrate a second hadith, same wording, and people say, "Hey, why did Imam Bukhari repeat the same hadith?" Man, come on, this is not called for. Ah. He does not repeat for the sake of repeating, brothers and sisters. No, he has his reasons. And often, the reason either is in the text, there is information there that's not in the other the, had, the hadith above, or in the isnad, there is information there that is important. Of course, uh, you know, most of us, we uh, are not hadith experts and so on. So, you know, the chain of narrators, the isnad, we're not too keen on that. But if you were keen on the isna, then you will realize that very often Al-Imam al-Bukhari mentions a second hadith, a second isna, because there is information there to add strength and weight to the validity of the hadith itself. Okay? So sometimes this is important. Not just one hadith or one version to get two or three versions because together they give you the complete picture. So with these two versions... We know that Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman was the keeper of the secret of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now, what is this secret? Ah, I know, I know you're wondering, right? What is this secret of the Prophet alayhi salam? Well, it was the names or the affairs of the hypocrites. The Prophet alayhi salam had informed Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman of the names of the hypocrites in Medina. And of course, he told him, do not tell anybody. This is mentioned by al hafiz ibn Hajar in his book, Fatful Bari. And we know that Umar ibn al-Khattab, once he came to Hudayfa, and he said to him, look, I know you are the keeper of the secret of the Prophet ﷺ, and I know you cannot tell me, you cannot divulge the secret, the names of the hypocrites. Just tell me one thing, though. Is my name among the names there? SubhanAllah. Umar ibn al-Khattab worried. That his name might be among the names of the hypocrites. So this is Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman. Now concerning the statement in the hadith that Uthman made to Hafsa, send us the manuscripts of the Quran, the suhuf. Uh, I, I explained this, right? The difference between suhuf and mushaf. They both come from the same root, meaning pages put together. But suhuf refers to pages that are still loose. Abu Bakr did not bind his, his, his pages. They were just put together and they were still loose. Okay? So that's called suhuf. This is what happened during the Khilafat of Abu Bakr Siddiq. In addition to that, as the scholars say, the chapters, the surahs of the Quran were not put in order. Of course, each surah was by itself and all its verses were in order. But to organize them, Al-Fatiha, Al-Baqarah, Ali Imran, Nisa, and so on, right? In that order, it wasn't done. It was just, you know, put together in loose pages. It was not in order. So you might have had to go to the middle to find Surah Ali Imran. But the whole Surah was, was written together, right? All the verses from one to the end. So the verses were in the correct order, but the Surahs themselves were not in order. Now, when Uthman ibn Affan, when the companions, the four companions made the, from the suhuf of, of Abu Bakr, they copied, they also placed the surahs in order that they come in. So this is also a major difference between Uthman's collection and that of Abu Bakr. 
they just didn't make copies. No, they also put the surahs in the order that they come in as we know in the Mus'haf. And when they bounded it, it became Mus'haf. Right. So Mus'haf refers to the Qur'an, two things. The Qur'an with the surahs in the proper order, plus it's bounded. So you cannot remove the pages. You have to rip it apart. The statement in the hadith that Uthman ordered Zaid ibn Thabit, right? The statement seems to imply that Uthman did not consult with the companions as to what to do. The problem came to his attention. Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman told him what the problem is. And the statement in the hadith seems to imply he just ordered Zaid ibn Thabit and that he did not do consultation with the companions. However, this is not true. It is not true. He did consult with the companions. Right? He gathered them and said, listen, this is the problem, guys. What can we do to solve it? And proof of this is in the fact that Ali ibn Abi Talib made a statement saying, do not say about Uthman except good. Right? When Uthman radiallahu anhu was murdered, Ali made this statement. He said, do not say about Uthman except good. For by Allah, he did not copy the masahif except after consulting us. Yes. Except after consulting us, Ali and other companions. So we know that he did consultation. And this was the advice that he got. And that's why he went ahead and ordered Zaid ibn Thabit. Well, he asked Hafsa to send her copy, and they made copies from that. Now, in the statement in the hadith, Uthman then ordered Zaid ibn Thabit, Abdullah ibn Zubair, and so on. Muhammad ibn Sirin, and this is one of the great scholars from the Tabi'een, he said that Uthman ibn Affan gathered 12 men from Quraysh and the Ansar. And among them was Ubay ibn Ka'b. Remember, Ubay ibn Ka'b had settled in Sham, in Syria, and the people learned from him in Syria how to recite Quran. But at this time, he happened to be in Medina. So Uthman actually gathered 12 people, Quraysh, from Quraysh and from the Ansar. And he said to them, who is the best writer? And the people replied, these 12 men replied, the one who used to write for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Zaid ibn Thabit. So here we have evidence again that Zaid used to write for the Prophet Alaihi Wasallam. He was a scribe. So the Quran was written in the lifetime of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then Uthman asked them, who is the most eloquent in terms of language? And they said, Sa'id ibn al-As. So Uthman said, Sa'id, you should recite, and Zaid, you should write. And that's how they did it, brothers and sisters. Right? One companion would recite, and Zaid would write, and he would compare this to what Abu Bakr did. Make sure it's the same. Right? SubhanAllah. Now, in the beginning, because it's the whole Quran, right? It's, it's, just, it's just not you know, easy for two people to do. So in the beginning, Said was reciting and Zaid was doing the writing. But, of course, recitation is probably easier than run writing. Because right? you have to handwrite and you have to make sure the letters are legible and all that. So he needed help in writing. And so other companions were uh, brought in to help write. And the number of copies had to be made and written, and then they sent, uh, like I mentioned, uh, a copy to each of the major city or province in the Islamic empire. Now, some of the 12 were helping to write, and Ubay ibn Ka'ab, remember he's one of the 12, he was helping in the recitation because, you know, not only had he memorized, but the Prophet uh, has mentioned, has, you know, told people that, they should learn the Quran, and he mentioned from Ubay ibn Ka'ab. Now, Ibn Hajar mentions the names of nine of these 12 companions. Not all 12, but nine. 
So there are four mentioned in the hadith, right? The four that Uthman uh, ordered, Zaid ibn Thabit, Abdullah ibn Zubair, uh, Said ibn al-As, and uh, who was the fourth one? Bear with me. Here we go. Abdurrahman ibn al-Harith. Right. So these four. Um, Ibn Hajar mentioned the names of nine. So he mentioned the names of these four. So Zaid ibn Thabit, Sa'id ibn al-As, Abdullah ibn Zubair, and Abdurrahman ibn, ibn al-Harith. These four are mentioned in the hadith. The extra five are Kathir ibn Aflah, Malik ibn Abi Amir, who is the grandfather of Anas ibn Malik, the well-known companion, Ubay ibn Ka'ab, Anas ibn Malik himself, radiallahu anhu, and Abdullah ibn Abbas. He did not mention the names of the other three, so we don't know them. Now, a question that comes in here is why was Abdullah ibn Mas'ud not included in the group of companions who were commissioned to do this collection for Uthman? Bearing in mind that Abdullah ibn Mas'ud is one of the most knowledgeable among the Sahaba about the Quran, subhanAllah. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. Now, it is authentic, brothers and sisters, that Abdullah ibn Mas'ud was a little bit upset when he heard what Uthman had commissioned and the fact that he was left out, he was not consulted, he was not asked to, to give input. He was a bit upset. And he said, I was not considered for the collection of the Mus'haf while another man was given that task. Bearing in mind his status in relation to the Quran. He went on to say, by Allah, I accepted Islam while he, that is the other man who happens to be Zaid ibn Thabit, was still in the loins of a kafir, meaning he was not born yet. SubhanAllah. So Abdullah bin Mas'ud is one of the very early Muslims. He and his mom embraced Islam very, very early. And they are among the very first of the migrants to Medina. And mashallah, he was very, very knowledgeable in the Quran and about the Quran. So he was a little bit upset that he was not uh, consulted about on this issue or he was not included in the effort to compile the Quran and he made the statement and remember you know the Sahaba they're great people but they're still human beings and yes a person can be upset over certain things now here is what really happened and why Uthman did not include him Uthman radiallahu anhu the Khalifa he ordered the collection to be done where in Medina. And Ibn Mas'ud is where? In Kufa, in Iraq. Now, there are no telephones. There is no internet. There is no aeroplane or car you can drive in a few hours from Iraq to Saudi to Medina, you know, 10, 12 hours. So, what was Osman supposed to do? Should he wait? Now, some might say, well, why not wait, man? Right? Abdullah ibn Mas'ud is a great companion. He is very knowledgeable in the Quran. You know, just to give you some idea, brothers and sisters, of his status in relation to the Quran, Al-Imam al-Bukhari mentions this hadith in his Sahih. Once the Prophet salam said to Ibn Mas'ud, recite for me. And he said to the Prophet salam, you want me to recite to you and it was revealed to you? And the Prophet salam told him, yes, sometimes I like to hear from other people. But the Prophet selected of all the companions, Ibn Mas'ud. He could have gone to any other companions and recite for me. So why not wait, right? I mean, this is a very knowledgeable companion. Well, the reality is it was an urgent matter. There was no time to wait. Uthman had no time to wait. If he waited, the dispute is happening, right? People are coming to blows almost. 
So he needs to end this before the Muslims start to fight among themselves and kill each other, literally kill each other. And like I said, there was no internet, there were no telephones, no fast mo modes of transportation. So, you know, it's not like he could wait one day and uh, Ibn Masood would reach Medina, right? That would that would be no problem. Or, you know, over Zoom, mashallah, right? Zoom, they could have uh, communicated and he could have given input. There wasn't these things. It was a very urgent matter. He could not wait for the weeks it would take to send a message to Kufa to tell Ibn Masood he's needed in Medina, come on over. All right, it will take a few weeks back and forth. So that's one thing. The second thing is, Uthman ibn Affan simply intended to make copies of the Suhuf that were collected by Abu Bakr. That was his intention. All he wanted to do was make copies from this. He also intended he would bind them together with the surahs in order, right? So he intended to go one step further to make the Suhuf into Mus'haf. But basically, that was his, his plan. To make copies of course he decided okay while we're going to make copies we might as well you know verify the text again to make sure that nothing was missed or left out so that's what he wanted to do subhanallah plus the person who did the collection for abu bakr siddiq was zaid ibn thabit and therefore he has the priority that no one else has he has the priority over no one else has. If Zaid was not consulted by Uthman, yes, Zaid would have been justified in saying, hey guys, how could you not consult with me? And I was the one who did it for Abu Bakr, man, right? SubhanAllah. So the truth is, brothers and sisters, that Uthman ibn Affan, radiallahu anhu, did not do anything wrong. There is no blame on him for not consulting or waiting to consult with uh, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud because it was a very urgent matter. And although Abdullah ibn Mas'ud was upset, really the truth is with Uthman ibn Affan. Yes, it is It, it is with the Khalifa, not with Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. Radiallahu anhum ajma'in. May Allah always be pleased with all of them. All right. The statement in the Hadith and sent to every Muslim province one copy of what they had copied. So the question is, how many copies? Because if you're going to send to each province, you know, you need a number of copies. The scholars have differed. Some say five, others say seven. It seems like it's seven copies, not five. Because the scholars have mentioned that he sent a copy to Mecca. He sent one to Sham, one to Yemen, Bahrain, Basra, Basra which is in Kuf, uh, uh, Iraq, Kufa, and Medina. He kept one in Medina. So if you count these the names of these cities, you will see that it's seven of them, right? So it seems like the correct view is that seven copies were made. One was kept in Medina and one was sent to Mecca and the other major, major cities or provinces in the Muslim empire. All right. Let's talk about this controversial issue here, right? The statement in the Hadith, he also ordered that all other Quranic materials be burnt be burned, in other words, destroyed. In one version of the hadith, it is said he ordered that, the, that, the, that the, whatever was written should be erased. And in another version, it is said that he ordered the people to wash the pages in order to get rid of what was written. Because when water gets on the ink, the ink would, of course, dissolve into the water, right? You know, with... Uh, if you write with uh, a ballpoint pen, then you know water does not really damage the ink so much. But if you write with a liquid ink pen, you know that, right? If water gets in the ink, it smudges very easily, subhanAllah, right? Because the, the, the ink is soluble, so it dissolves in the water and it spreads. And it, So if you wash it, it will, it will leave the plagiarist bank. It will get rid of the ink. So three things. Either he, either he ordered... That they be burnt or erased or washed. Ibn Hajar, he said that most narrations said he ordered that these Quranic materials should be burnt. So this is what really happened. Although there might have been a few cases where people, uh, you know, immersed their, their pages into water to get rid of the ink or they erased it by hand, right? But what happened mainly was that the copies were burnt. 
Ibn Battal, this is one of the very early scholars, all right? He actually lived in the fourth century of the Hijra, or the fifth century of the Hijra, sorry. And, and he actually did an explanation, and his is probably the earliest commentary on the hadith of Sahih al-Bukhari, right? Ibn Hajar come, came some 400 years later, and he did a commentary as well. But often he quotes Ibn Battal. Ibn Battal said that this hadith about burning the pages that people had of the Quran, their personal copies, is evidence that it is permissible to burn the books or the pages that have the name of Allah written on them. It is permissible to, 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 to destroy them or to get rid of them by burning them. And this is to ensure that it is not trampled upon by anyone. Yes. So you burn them. In our day, day and age, you recycle them, right? You shred them and recycle them. This way, no one will trample and walk on the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The big question, of course, and in particular, even the Orientalists, those who try to create doubts about the Quran, they ask, why did he order that these personal pieces and copies that people had to be burned? Why not keep them? Right? The Orientalists, they, 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 they zero in on this point. They question, why did he order that, you know, these things to be burned? Because they say the possibility exists that verses of the Quran were lost when the personal copies were burned or Maybe there were contradictions in the Quran, but we won't know now because everything else was burnt, right? So you see the doubt and the confusion they were trying to raise. Who knows? Maybe some companions would have had verses that would have contradicted other verses. But now we can't tell that because they are all destroyed. And in doing so, they were trying to raise doubts about the validity of the Quran. So why did he order these to be born? Of course, their argument is absolutely incorrect. Right? They said that he was trying to hide the possible presence of contradictory verses. This is incorrect, absolutely. Quran is from Allah, brothers and sisters, subhanAllah. Now, here are a couple of things to consider as to refuting this claim of the Orientalists. Now remember, they did not claim that for sure we have lost parts of the Quran or for sure contradictions were there. No. They just raised the possibility of that to leave doubts in the minds of people. Because when you have a doubt in your mind, you do not fully embrace something. So all the companions had agreed that whatever was compiled in written form into the Mus'haf, it was all of the Qur'an and nothing was missing. So that possibility that they raised to create doubts does not exist at all. Because the companions have agree had agreed at that time that whatever was put together and then binded or bounded to get form into the Mus'haf, it was all Qur'an, nothing was missing. See, this is why with man ordered these four companions not just to make copies right but to do a verification yes this was the great care that the, 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 the khalifa had and the companions had when they did the second collection for uthman because it was easy to take that one copy from abu Bakr's copy and just you know copy word for word now if anything was missing no one would know if there were any mistakes no one would know but they didn't do that they went through another process of verification. And in this way, we know for sure, with absolute certainty, that whatever we have in the Quran today is the entire Quran, all of it, nothing is missing. Okay. Um, brothers and sisters, it's 8, 8 p.m. I know our class is close to two hours. So let's take a short break. 
and you know get up stretch a little bit get a drink of water or something and in five minutes we will come back okay so at 805 inshallah we will resume just take a quick break and and so that you know you don't get too tired or it doesn't become monotonous okay jazakumullahu khairan wassalamu alaikum see you in five minutes inshallah
Welcome back, brothers and sisters. I know I said 8.05, but I came back at 8.07, so <laughs> pardon me, please. Allah barik fikum. I hope everyone uh, was able to get up and do a little bit of stretching and maybe grab a drink of something or a quick bite to eat. Alhamdulillah. <clears throat> okay, so we continue with our discussion uh, that all the companions, mashallah, had agreed that the copies that were made was all of the Quran and that absolutely nothing was missing. Because if anything was missing, whoever realized that would have objected. Whoever realized that would have objected. Because remember, when Abu Bakr Siddiq commissioned Zaid ibn Thabit and ordered him to collect the Quran, initially Zaid objected, didn't he? He said to Abu Bakr, how can we do something that the Messenger of Allah never did? And so from this we learn that the companions were not people who would sit quietly and let the wrong happen and not object to it. You know, there is the classic example also when um, Marwan ibn al-Hakam, this is one of the Umayyad Khulafa. As the Khalifa, he was doing the Salah and he was doing the Eid prayer and the Eid khutbah and all that. And he wanted to switch the order of the Eid prayer with the khutbah. You all know that the Sunnah is you do the prayer first and then the khutbah after. But people did not stick around to listen to his khutbah. And it's not wajib, by the way, to, to listen to the khutbah of Eid. I am not suggesting or encouraging anyone not to listen to the khutbah. In fact, I strongly, strongly urge and recommend and encourage you to stay for the khutbah as well. But the reality is from a fiqh perspective, it is not compulsory to listen to the khutbah of Eid. It is compulsory, however, to listen to the khutbah of Jum'ah. So you cannot leave for Jum'ah. So... Because people didn't like him, I mean, he's not even a companion, they would just do the Eid Salah and then leave. So he wanted to do the khutbah before the Salah to catch the people. But Abdullah, uh, Abdullah ibn Umar objected and told him, no, you cannot do this. He said, but the people are leaving. Abdul, uh, ibn Umar said, never mind, because this is the sunnah of the Prophet So my point in mentioning all of this is that the Sahaba were people who would never hesitate to object when something was out of place. Yes. And if anyone had objected, then of course, it would have been recorded. Unless, of course, we accuse all the companions of conspiring to remain quiet about missing verses of the Quran. And this is a very, very outrageous claim. To claim that all the companions conspired to, to stay quiet about missing verses of the Quran. One or two people might stay quiet. But as you start to increase the number, it becomes more unlikely that some that everybody would stay quiet. SubhanAllah, right? So it's, it's a very outrageous and ridiculous claim to claim, oh, the companions you know, didn't object, they stayed quiet. They knew they were missing verses, but they stayed quiet. That's not who the companions were. And it's, you know, which one is more outrageous? That a companion would, would object if something was out of place or that all of them conspired to stay quiet? No, subhanAllah. But why burn or destroy these copies? Why didn't Uthman leave these companions who had written their own personal, either the whole Quran or parts of it with them? Why did he order them to destroy it in the first place? Whether it's through burning or through washing or through erasing, right? Well, here's the thing. Many companions, brothers and sisters, had written their own comments and tafsir in the margins above and below the verses that they had written. Now remember, in those days, writing material was extremely hard to combine. So when a person had a piece of writing material, 
he would try to use every little bit of space. You know, if you're writing on the shoulder blade of a camel, right? It's, it's the shoulder blade of a camel is a huge thing. So they would try to write uh, uh, very close together and use every single available space. So many companions had written their own comments, right? Their own tafsir about certain words, about certain verses, above, below, on the right or the left. Now, if writing material was easy to come by, it would have been easier to do a separate commentary. Well, you know, this word in that verse means this. But they didn't have that luxury like you and I have today. So above that word, they had to write the meaning or the reason that the verse was revealed or something like that, right? Sabab and Nuzul. So this is the reality of what happened. Many of the companions had written their own comments and their own tafsir and so on in the margins and, and above or below the verses of the Quran that they had written down. Now the companion who did this, he knows the difference between what is Quran and what is his comments and what is his, his own tafsir. He would know that because he wrote it. He would know the difference. So there is no problem there. There is no problem there. You know where the problem is? If anyone else, any other companion, right? Let's say uh, Ibn Omar had gotten the, 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 the copy that Ibn Abbas wrote. Even he, Ibn Omar as a companion, might not always be able to differentiate between what is Quran and what Ibn Abbas wrote as tafsir or his own comments. What about the tabi'een and the generations after? SubhanAllah. So if anyone else were to get their hands on that copy, they would not know the difference between what the, what the Sahabi wrote as Quran and what he wrote as his own comments and his own notes. And so they could mistake all of this to be Quran. Now, the comments of or the notes of an individual may be right or wrong, so you can have contradictions there. But there is no contradiction with the Quran, whatever is Quran, subhanAllah. So you see the problem that Uthman thought about, right? He was looking long term, right? Down the road, subhanAllah. And the next generation or subsequent generations get their hand on this, they will not be able to tell the difference. And now you have greater arguments about the Quran. And now you would have doubts and confusion about Quran. Subhan, subhanAllah. So to ensure that this does not happen, he said, okay, guys, destroy everything that you have. Now make copies from this that, that we have done. So later on, this would have become a really big problem. SubhanAllah. But Allah the Exalted, of course, he promised to preserve the Quran in its pure form as revelation from himself. So he gave the Khalifa the insight and the companions who were alive at that time. He gave them the insight. And in this way, he protected his revelation and preserved it in, the, in its true form as it was in the lifetime of the Prophet ﷺ. So all these efforts of the companions and the Khulafa were to preserve the Quran as it was in the time of the Messenger of Allah ﷺ. SubhanAllah. Look at the efforts that they put up. Alhamdulillah. Now, let's talk a little bit about the verification process. How exactly did it happen? Now, when Abu Bakr Siddiq ordered the collection of the Quran, Zayd ibn Thabit did not just sit down and write Quran from his memory, no. In fact, he involved, Abu Bakr involved Omar, because remember, this, this idea was Omar's idea to begin with. So Omar played a major role in this compilation. So he stood in the masjid and he announced, whoever has learned something of the Quran from the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, let him come forward with it. So that's how they did it, right? Omar and Zaid sat in the masjid and each companion came and recited from memory what they knew of the Quran 
or whatever they had written, they brought it and say, hey, this is what I've written of the Quran. Now, if it was from memory, Zaid would listen and Omar would listen to what the other companion is reciting. Remember, Zaid and Omar are Hufaf themselves. So they would be able to tell whether mistakes were made or not. Just like in Taraweeh prayers, right? We have the, 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 the one of the Qaris at the back. He corrects the one who's reciting. And if a companion came with anything written, then Zaid ibn Thabit and Umar would read what's written and their half is. So as they're reading what's written, they're also double checking that with their own hifaz. So this is in the time of Abu Bakr. Whoever knows something of the Quran from the Prophet, Prophet salam, come forward with it. So whatever was written on pages, on stones and skins, made from date palm trunk, whatever, people brought everything. And he did not accept anything from anyone as Quran until two witnesses testified, yes, this is a verse from the Quran. Now, Ibn Hajar has some comments about what two witnesses really are. But before we get to that, Ibn Hajar said, this proves, right, the statement that he did not accept anything until two witnesses testified that this is Quran. This proves that Zaid ibn Thabit radiallahu anhu did not depend merely on what was written. Until those who received it by hearing it directly from the Prophet alayhi salam testified to it. So a person comes and says, here is what I've written. Ah, he needed somebody to come who heard this, who has memorized this, to come and say, well, here, yes, I know that verse. I've memorized it from the Prophet alayhi salam. Because if you depend on what is written only, anybody can write anything and pass it on, right? SubhanAllah. So their, their process was very, very rigorous. MashaAllah. Plus, like I said, Zaid had memorized. So as he's reading whatever is written, He's running that through his own memory and memorization of the Quran. So he would know that whether or not it was correct. And in this way, they were able to ensure the correctness and the authenticity of the Quran. It was maintained. Abu Bakr Siddiq actually ordered Omar and Zaid. He said to them, sit at the door of the masjid. And whoever comes with two witnesses to testify to anything from the book of Allah, write it. Come with two witnesses. Now, about two witnesses, Ibn Hajar has some ideas. And I would like to share that with you because they are interesting ideas. These two witnesses could be a memory and written form. See, when you and I hear witnesses, we're thinking of live people, right? Ah, uh, not necessarily. So if somebody had come with something written, plus he has memorized or somebody else had memorized, so whatever is written, whatever is memorized, if they coincide, that's two witnesses. So it could be memory and written form. Or two witnesses, it could mean that they needed two witnesses to come forward to bear witness that what is written here is indeed or was indeed written in the presence of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Remember Abu Bakr said, and whoever comes with two witnesses to testify to anything from the book of Allah, write it. That is two people who would testify that yes, this here was written in the lifetime or in the presence of the Prophet alayhi salam. Not written behind his back, right? Somebody sat down. And, and recollects, no, written in his presence. Or, here is another uh, point of view of the two witnesses, or the two witnesses would bear witness, so if we have two live persons who would bear witness, that whatever is written is one of the versions in which the Quran was revealed. Yes, you know what? I heard the Prophet reciting, the, reciting it this way. And we will talk about the versions, right? The Ahruf and the Qiraat of the Quran. Now, the bottom line is the goal was not to write anything except what was actually written in the presence of the Prophet. See how rigorous the companions were? 
not just to write down and say, okay, here's the Quran. No, their goal was to write only what is what was proven to have been written in the presence of the Prophet. Because if it was written in the presence of the Prophet, it means he dictated it. Not somebody recollecting afterwards and writing it, right? That's the problem with the Bible, right? It, it's, it's the disciples who recollect it. It's their recollection of the teachings of Isa alayhi salam many years before. You can have, you will have a lot of problems because people will forget. Yes. But when it's written in the presence of the messenger of Allah, khalas, there is nothing to forget. The messenger of Allah is dictated and the scribe is writing. And of course, the messenger of Allah trusts the scribe. On top of that, brothers and sisters, don't forget that Allah revealed the Quran to the Prophet ﷺ. So if any scribe, you know, you might think, well, how much can you trust? Uh, despite how much you may trust the person, it is still possible that that person could change a word here and there, right? We say wrong. Why? Because Allah was revealing the Quran to the Prophet ﷺ. And there was nothing to stop Allah the Exalted to inform the Prophet ﷺ, this scribe here, He's not, he's not trustworthy man, right? Subhanallah. So this was the goal. And that's why they were so rigorous and strict. They did not want to write anything as Quran, as written Quran, except what was proven to have been actually written in the presence of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Not just in his lifetime, in his presence, right? Remember that. Not what was written from memory alone, subhanAllah. Yes. So the companions had a very rigorous and, and strict method and process, masha'Allah. And this is exactly why we have absolutely no doubts or questions about the validity of the Quran. When you depend on what was written from memory alone, outside of the presence of the Prophet, ﷺ, you have problems, like I said, with the Bible. The disciples' recollection, right? Mark and Luke and, and these guys, their recollection of the teachings of Isa alayhi salam, they did not write it in his presence. Because if they did, he would be able to correct them, right? SubhanAllah. Now, we're told in the hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari that when Zaid and others collected the Quran for Uthman ibn Affan, Zaid said, I missed one verse from Surah Al-Ahzab, which I used to hear the Prophet ﷺ reciting a lot. Finally, I did not find it with anybody except Khuzayma al-Ansari, whose testimony was considered by Allah's Apostle wasallam equal to the testimony of two men. That verse was, among the believers, are men who have been true to their covenant with Allah. Chapter 33, verse 23. This is the statement of Zaid. I missed one verse from Surah Al-Ahzab, which I used to hear the Prophet reciting a lot. Finally, I did not find it with anybody except Khuzayma al-Ansari. Sorry. Ibn Hajar commented saying, this proves that when Zaid was doing the collection of the Qur'an, he did not depend on his own knowledge and memory alone. Because he knew, he used to hear this verse, but he didn't find it in anybody. So he searched for it. And eventually he found it. Okay? Eventually he found it. Now, let me just say, brothers and sisters, when he said, I did not find it, except with this one person, what he means is, I did not find it in written form. It does not mean that no one knew this verse except this one person because Zaid knew the verse. Remember that? He said, I used to hear the Prophet reciting it a lot. So not finding it with anyone means in written form. Only this one companion had it in written form. Okay. Now, Zaid ibn Thabit was instrumental in the two collections of the Quran, that of Abu Bakr Siddiq and that of Uthman ibn Affan. And each time he collected the Quran, he commented that he missed a verse each time. So that's two verses in written form. When he did the collection for Abu Bakr, he said a similar statement. 
I missed a verse, meaning in written form, and I found it with only one companion in written form. And then when he did the collection for, for, Uthman, uh, for Uthman, he said a similar thing. Now, these two verses are not the same verses that he missed. Each time it was a different verse. And the person he found it with in written form was a different person. So when he did the collection for Abu Bakr Siddiq, the verse he missed was at the end of Surah At-Tawbah, chapter 9, the end of Surah At-Tawbah. And the companion who had this verse in written form, the only one who had it in written form, is Abu Khuzaymah. Pay attention to the name, brothers and sisters, Abu Khuzaymah. When Zaid collected the Quran for Uthman, the verse he missed was from Surah Al-Ahzab, so it's a different surah. And this verse, he found it in written form with another companion named Khuzayma ibn Thabit al-Ansari. Abu Khuzayma and Khuzayma ibn Thabit are not the same people, brothers and sisters. They're not the same person. Don't be fooled by Khuzayma and Khuzayma. These are two completely different people. They're two different persons. Now, the verse that was found in written form only with Khuzayma ibn Thabit al-Ansari, when the collection was done for Uthman ibn Affan from Surah al-Ahzab, Zaid ibn Thabit mentioned that this companion, Khuzayma ibn Thabit al-Ansari, that his testimony was equal to the testimony of two men. Now, since it is mentioned in that hadith, I want to share with you this story. It's a short story. Now, once the Prophet, السلام, he bought a horse from a Bedouin, a desert Arab. And he didn't have the, the, the money to pay at the time. So he told the Bedouin, look, follow me to Medina, to home, and I will give you the price, the money. Now, while they're walking, right, and the Prophet ﷺ is walking in front and this man is behind, some people did not know that the Prophet ﷺ had bought the horse, this horse from the man. So they came and they offered this man more money for the horse. And the man, subhanAllah, he was enticed. Ah, this guy's giving more money. I might as well sell it to him, right? So he was enticed by this offer of more money. So he said to the Prophet ﷺ, either you buy the horse or I will sell it to somebody else. And the messenger of Allah ﷺ, look at his adab, his manners. He said to the man, haven't I already bought the horse from you? I mean, we agreed. We agreed on the price. All that was left was for you to follow me, go with me to home, and I will give you the money. So the deal has been sealed. I didn't say I'm going to think about it. You know, give me a few minutes. Let me think about it. We agreed. You like the price. You name the price. I agreed. We agreed that I'm I'm buying the horse. All that was left for your, the money to exchange my from my hand to your hand, and I will take possession of the horse. So... The Prophet told the man, haven't I already bought the horse from you? And the man denied. He said, no. Bring your witness, man, if you claim you bought the horse from me, right? Because remember, he wants the more money. He wants to sell it for more money, subhanAllah. And this is where we see, brothers and sisters, that your integrity is worth more more than all the money in the world, subhanAllah, your integrity. So the man denied, says, no, I, you, I never sold you the horse. In fact, if you claim I sold you, produce your witness, man. Now, there was nobody else present at the time when the prophet uh, 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 and the man made the deal, subhanAllah, just the two of them. And the man knew this, right? See, this is why he's challenging the messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa so produce your witness because he knows there was no witness. But remember, 
all of this is happening now while they're you know in Medina, right? So people have gathered. And the companion Khuzayma ibn Thabit stood up and said, I bear witness that you bought this horse from him. I bear witness. SubhanAllah. Remember, he wasn't there. Wherever the Prophet met the man, and they agreed on the price, and now and they agreed on the deal, and now they're coming home to get the money for payment. He did not witness the purchase. But he just stood up and said, I bear witness that you bought this horse from him, as if he was there. And the Prophet salam, was kind of taken aback. And he said to Huzayma, what are you witnessing about, man? You weren't even there. What are you witnessing about? And subhanAllah, look at what Khuzayma radiallahu anhu said. He said, your truthfulness, O Messenger of Allah. I wasn't there. But if you said you bought the horse from the man, khalas, we be, I believe you 100%. I wasn't there, but I believe you 100%. Absolutely no doubt. So I be, I'm bearing witness to your truthfulness, O Messenger of Allah. And so the Prophet salam considered the testimony of Khuzayma equal to that of two men. And this is a hadith in Sunan Abi Dawood, and it's an authentic hadith. So this is the story of Khuzayma ibn Thabit al-Ansari, whose testimony was considered equal to that of two people. Now just remember, you need two witnesses, but his testimony alone was considered as two, subhanAllah. Sindhi, this is one of uh, our scholars who did a commentary on the hadith of Abi Dawood, Sunan Abi Dawood. He said that the Prophet salam, did not keep the horse. He returned the horse to the man. Alas. You know, take your horse, man. That's it. it is, and he mentioned, Sindhi mentioned that the man died the same night that the horse was returned. So he never got to benefit from that extra money, subhanAllah. Prophet ﷺ returned the horse, says, that's okay, keep your horse. Sell it for more if you want now. But subhanAllah, he passed away the same night. Allahu Akbar. All right, so this brings us to the end of uh, these slides. Um, we still have a lot more to discuss on the, uh, on the collection of the Quran. But I... Uh, I have some questions that I prepared and I would like to get to the questions because time may run out. So if I can get to the questions. No, uh, let's try this one. I am not sure brothers and sisters if we had answered these questions already. Um, can anyone remember? If we have, can you tell us in a chat or something? This is about the very beginning. We, we may have done these questions. If we have, no problem. We can go. I have another set of questions. But I can't recall going through these questions. Maybe we can go through them on the other set, inshallah. We should have time. Okay. So you know the, you know the drill, right? These are multiple choice questions. And Shepard, you are to done these, uh, we have done these. Done uh, these? Uh, yes, these are done. Okay. Allah, you very fiq. Shukran. All right, so let me bring up the other set of questions, which we didn't do because I know we didn't do because I did them today. So here we go. Bismillah. Bismillah. All right. And like I said, it's multiple choice questions. You choose the correct answer. Um, and these questions are based on last week's work. And of course, we had started the life of uh, Uthman ibn Affan, so it's about his life. All right. Our first question is, when did Uthman ibn Affan, may Allah be pleased with him, assume the seat of the Khilafah? When did he officially became the Khalifa? On what date? Here are our options. A, the first of Muharram in the year 24 of the Hijrah. B, the first of Muharram in the year 25 of the Hijrah. C, the first of Muharram in the year 23 of the Hijrah, and D, none of the above. What is the correct answer?
Yes. I can see the chat, brothers and sisters. So you can type your, your, your the question and, the, and, the, and the, the, the letter of the answer. So you put one A or one C or one D, whatever it is. Now, any, any takers? When did Uthman ibn Affan officially became the Khalifa, you know, and, and began to function in that capacity? What was the date? And there is no difference of opinion. That's why I'm asking this. This is very clear. You have four options. Um, which is the correct answer? Is it the first of Muharram, 24 AH or 25 AH or 24, 23rd AH or none of the above? Okay, I'm going to give you another 15 seconds and then oh, you, you brothers and sisters need to do revision, man. You have to stay with the program. Yes. All right. I know you're, you're probably scrambling, flipping the pages of the handout, trying to find that. All right. Okay, don't worry. The correct answer, brothers and sisters, is A. Question one, the correct answer is A. Yes. I'll put it in red for you. He was officially installed as a Khalifa on the very first day of Muharram in the 24th year of the Hijrah. And the first prayer he led as the Khalifa was Salatul Asr. Okay. All right. Very good. Question number two. Who instituted the earlier Adhan on Fridays? A. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam B. Abu Bakr Siddiq Radiallahu Anhu C. Umar Ibn Al-Khattab Radiallahu Anhu Or D. Uthman Ibn Affan Radiallahu Anhu Which one of them introduced the earlier Adhan on Fridays? I'll give you a few seconds to again you can as I said, you can type the answer in the chat, as you used to do before, right? Question two, put two, and then put the number or the, the, the letter, so I know that it belongs to that question. Who instituted the earlier Adhan on Fridays? I see the chat is very silent, mashallah. Okay, so somebody, and now I see one C. One C. No, it's 1A, right? The 24th year of the Hijrah, not the 23rd. In the, the first of Muharram, the 23rd year of the Hijrah, Umar anhu was still very much alive and he would die a whole year later, right? At the end of the year, subhanAllah. All right, so it was the 24th year of the Hijrah. Umar passed away uh, about three days left in the 23rd year of the Hijrah. Now. Uh, he was stabbed actually and then by the time he died another three days and buried so Uthman became the Khalifa uh, in on the force of Muharram in the 24th year of the Hijrah okay but what about question number two who instituted the earlier Adhan on Fridays was it the Prophet alayhi salam was it Abu Bakr Siddiq was it Umar ibn al-Khattab was it Uthman ibn Affan so what is the correct answer Yep, type your answer in, answers in the chat. That's the easiest and fastest way. I'm going to give you a few seconds more. All right, this one is actually supposed to be quite easy, brothers and sisters. The correct answer of question number two is D. It was Uthman ibn Affan, radiallahu anhu, the third uh, Khalifa, who instituted the the earlier Adhan. The earlier Adhan. Okay? Remember, at the time of the Prophet, alayhi salam, and the time of Abu Bakr and Umar, there was just one Adhan. That is when the Imam sat on the member. But in Uthman's time, he introduced an earlier Adhan. All right? Okay, beautiful. Question number three, why was the earlier Adhan instituted? What was, what was the purpose? All right, here are our, um, our choices. A, to remind people of Allah the Exalted. B, 
people just love the sound of the adhan in the middle of the day. C, to inform people that the Jumu'ah prayer was near. And D, all of the above. Why was the earlier adhan instituted by Uthman ibn Affan? Radiyallahu anhu arda. What's the reason? So come on. Type in the chat, brothers and sisters. I see the chat is very quiet. I see a Bibi Umarali, I see a Sheikh Haq, I see a Annie Muhammad, Dean Dash Message. All right. Somebody put D, all of the above. All right. Any other takers? Is there any other? Um, and don't forget to put the, 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 the number of the question, right? If you put D alone, I don't know. Are you talking about question number two or question number three or question number one? So if you put 3D or 2A, I will know exactly what it is. So somebody has D, and I'm assuming that is the answer for question number three. Why was the earlier Adhan instituted? All right, I'm going to give you a few more seconds, see if anybody comes up with a different answer. Okay. Sister Fahima, yes, you also have D. I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that it's question number three you're talking about. Okay. All right, a few more seconds, brothers and sisters. Any other choices? Or you're still thinking about the choices? All right. Um, the correct answer, brothers and sisters, is actually C. Number three, the correct answer is C. The earlier Adhan was instituted to inform people that Salat al Jumu'ah was near. Now, of course, the Adhan would certainly remind people of Allah the Exalted. And, you know, people love to hear the adhan i mean i know when i hear a, a beautiful adhan even if it's a, 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 a on the internet or a cd you know subhanallah or our brother just practicing right it's not even salah time and you know somebody is practicing yes three three c is the correct answer it's beautiful it sounds good so i can understand why you put d as the correct answer but if you go back to the information you will see and learn that the earlier Adhan was instituted when what? When Medina expanded, right? The population grew. And, and now uh, people are busy with businesses, right? And they're not paying attention to Jumu'ah time. So the real uh, 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 issue at hand was to remind people and inform them that Salat al-Jumu'ah was, was near and close and that they should finish off what they're doing so that they can attend the Jumu'ah prayer. So the correct answer is C, although, um, you know, uh, A and B are, are also, uh, uh, you know, applicable. All right, let's move on. Question number four. The institution of the earlier Adhan on Fridays is not bid'ah because, why is it not bid'ah? Because remember, it was never done by the Prophet ﷺ, so why is it not bid'ah? So here are our options. A, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has exhorted the Muslims to hold fast to his sunnah and the sunnah of, of the rightly guided Khulafa after him, plus all the companions at the time accepted it as, as something good. B, it is a good thing to remind people. C, a companion instituted it. It's not bid'ah because a companion instituted it. Or B, it's not a good, it's not bid'ah because it's a good thing to remind people of salah, right? And D, it is not bid'ah because the Muslims of today have accepted it as part of the Islamic tradition. Why isn't it bid'ah? The earth institution of the earlier Adhan. All right, so question number four. What is the correct answer? Type your answers in the chat, please.
Why isn't it bid'ah? What is the reason it is not considered bid'ah? It's actually considered sunnah. All right. So we have a, a, a 4A, 4A, mashallah. Two people so far with A. All right. Any other choices? A few more seconds. Come on. Any other choices? All right. So the correct choice or the correct answer is A. Yep. Those who put A, are you are correct. It is not bid'ah at all because the Prophet salam told, exhorted the Muslims, right? And there's a hadith, an authentic hadith about this. You have the details in the handout. He exhorted the Muslims to hold fast to his sunnah. And the sunnah, right? See, he called it sunnah of the rightly guided khulafa after him. So following the Prophet's advice is sunnah. And his advice is to hold firmly to the sunnah of the rightly guided khulafa after him. So subhanAllah, it is not bid'ah for this reason. All right, very good. And our last question is, who is the skilled tracker? who died during the first year of Uthman's rule as the Khalifa. We talked about this. There was a skilled tracker who, who managed to track down the Prophet salam and Abu Bakr when they were migrating to Medina. This skilled tracker, he died during the first year of Uthman's rule as the Khalifa. Who is this person? What's his name? Here are the choices. A, Abdurrahman ibn Awf. B, Abu Ubaidah. C. Suraqa ibn Malik and D. Anas ibn Malik. Who is the skill tracker? What is his name? All right. We have an Ann Muhammad. Your answer to four now came in, so that's that's very delayed. You put four A and that's the correct answer, but it's been a while. What is the and correct answer for number five? Who is the skill tracker? who died during the first year of Uthman's reign as the Khalifa. And you have four options. Okay, so we have a 5B, MashaAllah. Yes, any other choices? We have a B, Abu Ubaidah. Any other choices? We have a 5B. It seems like uh, those on uh, on YouTube are the ones uh, answering questions. What happens to the folk on, folks on Facebook? Yes, brothers and sisters, what is the name of the skill tracker? You forgot? We covered it last week. So if you're flipping pages of the handout, yes, go back to last week's work. And you will find it there. Is it Abdul Rahman ibn Awf? Is it Abu Ubaidah? We have a B, by the way. Is it Suraqa ibn Malik? Is it Anas ibn Malik? All right. A few more seconds. Okay, fingers down, no more typing. The correct answer is C, brothers and sisters. His name is Suraqa ibn Malik. He is the skill tracker. No, not 5B. Sorry, guys, not Abu Ubaidah. Actually, Abu Ubaidah radiallahu anhu, you guys forgot this, but he passed away in the Khilafat of Umar during the plague of Amwas. Abu Ubaidah, that's when he died. Not in the, the, the reign of Uthman at the Khalifa, yes. So it was Suraqa ibn Malik. He is the one who was a very skilled tracker. And he followed the Prophet salam after they came out from the cave and they headed west towards Jeddah side. And then they curved around north towards Medina. When they were on their way to Medina heading north, he managed to come across them and he followed them. But every time he got a, a bit close, the, the front hooves of his horse would sink deep into the sand and he would fall over the head of the horse. And this happened 
you know, the first time it happened, he found it a bit strange. The second time it happened, he says, whoa, what's happening here? The third time he realized something was happening here. And of course, he used to hear a lot about the Prophet salam and about the message and so on. So he was able to, to put two and two together, as we say, and he would eventually embrace Islam, mashaAllah. So his name is Suraka ibn Malik. Yes, that is the name of the skill tracker, mashaAllah. All right, very well, brothers and sisters. Um, you know, he, these questions are intended to allow you to interact with the information, mashaAllah, because we don't want you to just acquire the theory, theoretical knowledge in the, in the brain, but to also, um, you know, keep the information relative. So, uh, you know, do some revision, you know, whatever we've covered this week, reread it before you come to class next week, because the questions will be based on these, the information we covered this week, right? So take care, everyone. We'll stop here for today. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all of us. May he open our hearts and minds so that not only can we understand this wonderful message he has revealed for the upliftment of mankind, but that we would be inspired to live by the message. May Allah teach us what is beneficial to us. May he cause us to benefit from what we learn. And may he increase our knowledge so that we can better serve him and worship him. See you next week, inshallah. Same time, same place. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.